It makes chemistry easier to draw bonds as fairly rigid lines or as just two dots that are connecting two things. But bonds are never static and it's important to keep that in mind. And so bond length is never a static thing, but instead something that is produced by the repulsive forces between electrons, the attractive forces between the electrons and the positively charged nuclei on either side. Perhaps there's a repulsion between the two nuclei themselves. And so there are a lot of forces at play, but what that means is that you have bonds that often oscillate a bit in length. Sometimes they're a bit longer, sometimes they're a bit closer. And so if you were to plot the length or the distance between these two nuclei and the frequency at which these distances occur, what you would get is a bell curve that tends to center around a certain length. And that length is what's called the bond length. And that bond length is sort of a sweet spot between the attractive forces between the electrons in the bond and the positively charged nuclei and the repulsive forces between these two electrons and between the nuclei themselves. And so bonds oscillate a fair bit in their length, but they tend to settle into this sweet spot, which is known as the bond length. And the bond length is inversely proportional to the strength of the bond meaning that a very strong bond will be much shorter because there are such attractive forces that they can overcome your usual electron-electron repulsion that's going on. So know that bond length is always inversely proportional to bond strength. A short bond is a strong one. And you'll notice that if you have double and triple bonds where you have not only the sigma bond, but also pi bonds added on top of that, those nuclei will be very close as a result because those are very, very strong bonds. The second thing to realize is about this term known as bond energy because it can be somewhat confusing. Realize that as you see here, a bond occurs because it's energetically favorable for the electrons and the nuclei to settle into this arrangement that puts them in a state of low potential energy. And so a bond occurs usually because it is energy releasing and the product ends up being at a lower energy state than the reactants were initially. But don't be fooled to think that bond strength represents the potential energy of the electrons. Instead, the bond energy is the energy that's required to break a bond. So it's the difference between the high potential energy state that the two atoms had initially and the low potential energy state that they have when they're bound together. And so bond energy for a very, very strong bond will be high. And the reason for that is because it takes a lot of energy to break a strong bond. And that's what bond energy stands for, the energy that you need to break that bond. You can also think of it as bond dissociation energy. So sometimes when you're working through questions, you will see questions that try to hit on this distinction between potential energy and bond energy. And realize that a strong bond has atoms that are and the electrons of those atoms that are in a very, very low energy stable state. So they're in a very low potential energy state that is very stable. But their bond energy is very high because it takes a lot of energy that you have to put in in order to break apart that highly stable, strong bond. And so be aware of that distinction. Low potential energy when you have a strong bond. That's why strong bonds are formed, because they lower the potential energy of the electrons and protons and, and nuclei involved. But the bond energy is very, very high, and that's because it takes a lot of energy in order to break that.